Hey there, welcome to the Impatient Entrepreneur Podcast, a show where we hear from entrepreneurs and business owners who are chomping at the bit to make their mark on the world. I'm your host, Lauren Quedar Cockrell. Now let's hurry up and get to the good stuff. Hi, friends. Welcome back. I have fellow story brand guide Jeff Losser here today of Brandscribed, and I'm really looking forward to all of his knowledge and stories today. He's he's a wonderful storyteller in his own right, and so we're going to hear, I think, some really exciting things. So, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. Already some pressure on me, so I'll, I'll take it. Yes. All right. Huge, huge pressure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We got this. Now, all, we, this is a fun show. Uh, we, we laugh. We cry. We tell stories. So, um, Jeff, tell our tell our listeners about you. Tell us tell us about Brandscribed, your and and what you do, and all that good stuff. Sure. Well, it, it was a long, strange trip to get to that point. Uh, as far as being an entrepreneur, um, I, I began my career uh, as an aspiring journalist. So that was the career path, and I uh, felt like I was most in my element with that specifically a sports journalist so uh would would dabble uh with um working with the associated press uh work with gannett and all those big publications and you know found myself in the locker rooms and the press conference rooms on the field and you know as a kid who wanted to be an athlete but was maybe a little too short too small too slow too winded uh <laughs> and it just wasn't in the cards this seemed like mm-hmm. always the next best thing for me um but life happens and in hindsight, I probably had a little bit of the chase the shiny object syndrome mm. that came along with things. And certainly, um, you know, obviously your podcast title resonates with me, as I said before this. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm not only an intra- impatient entrepreneur, I'm probably an impatient person in general. Yeah. <laughs> so when things didn't kind of come to fruition and then that freelance career didn't really take off. And when print started giving way to digital, I kind of found myself uh, kind of scrambling to kind of figure out what was next. And um, around that time, I was also getting into a relationship with my uh, my then wife, and uh, you know, doing the freelance thing wasn't necessarily putting food on the table. So uh, I, I first pivoted uh, into um, uh, being an adjunct professor and teaching uh, English composition, and again enjoyed that. But again, it was not something that felt sustainable. Uh, I was at a university, a couple different colleges where everyone seemed to be tenured for life. So here I was again, just kind of <laughs> going from opportunity to opportunity. And um, uh, and that's when I kind of fell into sales and marketing. Uh, okay. First in home improvement, which was incredibly ironic because I'm like the least <laughs> handy person in the world. Um, but uh, I discovered I had an act for actually um, helping to consult, helping to problem solve. Um, figuring out solutions when it came to the issues that these homeowners had and um, quickly worked myself uh, up into management ranks and leading teams. And, um, you know, on paper, it seemed great, but I wasn't really passionate for the reasons mentioned in the industry itself. So Mm -hmm. wound up then discovering digital marketing, which seemed like the perfect combination of this newfound sales aptitude that I had gained and my passion for Mm -hmm. the media and um, uh, was with a few different startups, all of them eerily similar, where they uh, were really good mm. at promoting themselves and, and kind of serving, serving as their own best client, if you will. Uh, they brought on a lot of high-profile clients, as I know you're familiar with uh, that world, um, mm-hmm, specifically mm-hmm. with reputation management. So usually at that point when they were reaching out to us, the, the house was already burning and they needed some really immediate help to kind of figure out mm. how they can kind of yeah. change course and change the narrative. And um, uh, they even mm-hmm. brought in uh, some really talented uh, employees. Uh, so all of that was great, except we had this one small problem of actually delivering on a consistent basis at the end of the day. So it all looked good, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. on the surface, but yeah. when it came down mm-hmm. to actually delivering, that's when there was an issue. And um, again, I was in management in those those different organizations. Uh, so here I am kind of reporting to ownership and kind of conveying down the messaging to my teams. Meanwhile, telling them, hey, pay no attention to the elephant in the room. Just keep your head down and grind and mm-hmm. don't worry about the results or the lack thereof. And that wore on me uh, to the point where I grew mm-hmm. disenfranchised with it. 
Uh, so fast forward to uh, 2019 and uh, kind of forced my way out of that last opportunity that was very similar to the others mm -hmm. and found mm -hmm. myself at a crossroads. And mm -hmm. this was not only a career crossroads, mm -hmm. uh, but a life crossroads, because as often mm -hmm. is the case, um, it was a perfect storm of all these different things that were happening at once. So at that point, it was the beginning of the end of my marriage. Mm -hmm. And I was dealing mm -hmm. with, you know, some silly legal issues. And I was, you know, it was mm -hmm. affecting, it was taking a toll on my health. And uh, to the point where mm -hmm. I uh, woke up on my birthday to a panic attack. Uh, so, uh, you know, talk about a literal mm -hmm. wake-up call uh, to the point where I knew that yeah, I needed to wow. really kind of figure out how to get my act together again. I had two small kids that were counting on mm -hmm. me, um, and mm -hmm. I just needed yeah. to figure out what that next chapter of my life was going to consist of. So uh, it forced me to take inventory mm -hmm. of the different hats that I had worn prior. Um, and the immediate common through line that I had discovered uh, with all these seemingly disconnected paths as a sports journalist, as a teacher, as a sales uh, manager, and oh, by the way, in between that time, I also went back to school. I went to film school and got my MFA in screenwriting. So dabbled in that too. Okay. <laughs> so all of those, um, yeah. you know, those seemingly disconnected um, roles uh, led me to a very connected through line, which was storytelling. Uh, so, you know, whether it be as mm -hmm. a journalist, as a screenwriter, as a salesperson, manager, et cetera, if you don't have a compelling story that resonates with your intended audience, it really doesn't matter what else you bring to the table. You can have all the bells and whistles in the world. Right. If you're not able to make that connection, then it's likely going to fall upon deaf ears and you're back to square one. So I leaned into that and um, I, I put that vibe out there, if you will. And on more than a couple of occasions, I was told, oh, you know what? That sounds a lot like Story Brand. You should check out Donald Miller and his stuff. Oh. And I know you're very familiar with, the, <laughs> yeah. with him as well, being a fellow guide. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I did. I checked mm -hmm. out the book. And it was extremely serendipitous because, as you know, he uses the running analogy of the hero's journey uh, to explain how to build a brand. Right. And the hero's journey by mm -hmm. Joseph A. Campbell, who's kind of the godfather of that, years and years mm -hmm. ago, that was screenwriting right. one-on-one. So I learned that in school. I taught mm -hmm. it as a professor, but I never equated it to the brand building mm -hmm. side of things. I always thought of it as storytelling 101. Right. You know, you start with a character, they have a right. problem, it's affecting them on a very visceral level. In comes, <laughs> you know, the, the guy mm -hmm. who displays empathy and authority, leads them on a simple path, and yada, 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 have a live after. But it was extremely revelatory mm -hmm. for me to see how seamlessly each of those beats translated over to the business and the brand building side. You start with a hero character and that's mm -hmm. the client, okay? They have a problem that they can't solve mm -hmm. on their own. They reach out to a guide, you being the guide, who says, hey, listen, I understand how you feel. I've been through that myself. Here's a plan that mm -hmm. I've been able to put together that's been proven for me and others. Let me help you along the way and get you to that happily ever after. So um, from there, mm -hmm. I went back to my freelancing roots uh, to try to get back to relevance, if you will, mm -hmm. and um, and then kind of yeah. got the itch as far as figuring out, well, how can I brand myself? How can I, you know, kind of eat my own cooking, if you will? So um, I, uh, I launched right. Brandscribed mm -hmm. in June of uh, 2022. Uh, that's when I launched the site, and I spent that entire summer just kind of immersing myself into what that lead deliverable was going to be. So uh, I decided it was going to be a masterclass mm -hmm. and um, I'm, I'm a big collector. You know, sometimes it's, it's, it's collecting things that really have no purpose other than, you know, it's there and I feel like I could accumulate it and there might be a value to it at some point down the road. <laughs> I probably got that from my mom. She was big. She, we would have all these Tupperware containers that would just kind of add up. And all these like paper, you know, bags <laughs> yeah, yeah. and, you know, uh, from, from grocery shopping and all these mm -hmm. newspapers that I'm like, hey, mom, why do we still have this newspaper from two years ago? Oh, you know, I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. So <laughs> I probably inherited that for her. Yeah. You never know yeah. when it might be. I might the need news it. Might be new again. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, I tapped oh. back into all this information that I had accumulated um, when I was at my crossroads in, in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I knew at that right. point that I needed to start from within. And I needed to get my myself on track before I can get a business on track. And um, I just really immersed myself into 
um, mentors, into books, into all these materials and just started collecting, started aggregating um, all these things that I mm-hmm. felt really hit a mark for me and, and really resonated. And uh, so mm-hmm. when it was time for me to create my lead deliverable, I just tapped back into the well. And I figured, okay, well, I want to really kind of speak to an audience that, A, I know I can relate to, and B, that I know that I can kind of share the secret sauce of what worked for me and uh, and, and kind of pay it forward. So um, what that originally was, was just simply, um, you know, other people who had had a level of success in the past in their previous role. And then for whatever reason, th- they had to transition into a new chapter, into a new role, into a new path. Um, but we're struggling to figure out how they can change the narrative for themselves from what they were seen as right. to what they want to be seen as. So um, I uh, spent the entire summer, as mentioned on that. I even recruited a few uh, co-facilitators to fill in the gaps as far as where I felt like my blind spots were. And I was so proud of the end result. So, uh, you know, it was this 80 plus page, you know, companion workbook. And, wow. you know, I had all these modules and everything was great. So I finally went to market in the fall and, you know, you know, invested, you know, time and money and resources into getting that out there. And uh, Lauren, the good news was Mm -hmm. that each person that attended that masterclass wound up becoming a client in some capacity. Uh, The bad news is that two people attended. So, um, (laughs) uh, yeah, but not a great batting average when you have um, (laughs) more facilitators than students. You know, not necessarily what I was going for. Yeah, so yeah, that like, was, um, to, you <laughs> yeah. know, honestly, just a very humbling experience for me. And I was trying to figure out sure. well, where did I go sure. wrong? And at that point, uh, I knew about the Story Brand Certified Guide, you know, program, but mm-hmm. it was hard for me to justify, mm-hmm. well, you know, it, it kind of a chicken or the egg thing. So do I invest all this money that I haven't right. generated right. yet? into this thing that sounds mm-hmm. great, but is is quite the investment, or do I figure out how I can get that and redirect it first? Well, the latter part didn't work mm-hmm. as planned. So I decided to, you know, throw caution mm-hmm. to the wind and I got certified last December. And, um, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I'm certainly glad I did. The community itself, as you know, uh, mm-hmm. is so amazing and so yeah. supportive. And that was one of my fears going in is that, mm-hmm. hey, if all of us are really kind of putting the same or similar message out there, (laughs) aren't we going to kind of be stepping on each other's toes? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be a cutthroat environment? And it couldn't have been further from the truth. I mean, what I've realized and what I continue to realize is that um, the the sandbox is getting bigger and bigger by the day, especially as people are realizing Mm -hmm. how essential it is for them to really lean into their story and and to really captivate an Mm -hmm. audience and figure out how their message can resonate with that audience. Um, and, um, you know, mm-hmm. it, it was, it was huge for me, uh, because it allowed me to practice mm-hmm. what I preach a little bit more. So I discovered in hindsight mm-hmm. that, um, I was casting way too broad of a net, you know, uh, a person who's transitioning mm-hmm. from one role to another could fall into so many different categories. <laughs> yeah. You know, you could be, you know, right, a teacher, right. you could be a construction worker, you could be this, that, or the other. And, um, uh, you know, from all different walks of life at all different points as well. And, um, and, and that was, you know, probably the, the, the big, you know, the first big learning moment that I had when it came to figuring out how to clarify my own message. Um, so I sure. uh, so, yeah. uh, decided to kind of um, go back to my roots a little bit. And as mentioned in the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, always passionate about sports. That was my, my thing. And um, decided to lean into that as far as reaching out to former pro athletes um, who uh, were transitioning out of that career and into a new thought mm-hmm. leadership role. Mm-hmm. And those words seem to really kind of mm-hmm. connect with me too, especially as a journalist, as far as figuring out, yeah. well, it's it's mm-hmm. one thing to kind of, you know, put yourself out there and have, you know, these deliverables and have this message. But what is it about that message that is going to educate, inform, and really help to distinguish yourself as an industry expert and set yourself apart, especially when you're in these increasingly saturated fields. So uh, the more former pro athletes that I had spoken with, the more that I was seeing a a very common trend of, hey, listen, all my life, I was known as this. 
I was the big man on campus, the big woman on campus. And I was, you know, at the top of my game, you know, literally. And one day the phone Mm -hmm. stops ringing. Um, You're a free agent. The contract runs out. And now all of a sudden you have to figure out, okay, what's next? And typically this is happening at a relatively young age, you know, early, you know, late Mm twenties, early mm thirties, um, you know, typically at a time when it's probably a little too soon to just kind of, you know, go into a retirement home and take up golf and play bingo, uh, (laughs) nor is it something that would probably be satisfying (laughs) because they still have this purpose-driven passion that they want to figure out how to Mm -hmm. leverage and they want to parlay into something that will define that next phase of their life and the next phase of their career. Um, And what I also learned is that there were very limited resources that were available to them during their active playing days to get them to bridge that mm-hmm. gap from athlete to entrepreneur mm-hmm. or solopreneur or whatever that next career might take. So um, I put that out there, mm-hmm. uh, wound up getting my first uh, client in that space um, in the spring of this year, uh, a former New York Giant, mm-hmm. amazing mm-hmm. guy, very purpose-driven, cool. very passionate. And you know, obviously that, that you know, speaks mm-hmm. to me as well. And uh, within the first couple mm-hmm. months, I was and and I was flying by the seat of my pants at this point because I was still looking for that proof of concept. (laughs) But within the first couple months, I was able to get him a guest spot on three different podcasts. I was able to get him uh, in front of a uh, TV producer who uh, is remains extremely interested in doing a reality show around him, which was really cool. And I also Mm -hmm. was able to, Mm -hmm. most importantly, perhaps clarify his message and clarify his audience so he knew exactly how to get in front of them but also knew exactly how he could become uh, a relatable figure when he transitions into his own deliverables you know really build that no like and trust factor so a little part pr a lot of coaching um and a lot of just kind of working on figuring out how to structure your your brand you know, in such a way where it can be kind of a plug and play thing over time. So that brings me essentially to present day where I, I've since niched back a little bit. So it's not just pro athletes, um, okay. but really anyone that has been a high profile figure in some way, shape or form has had a level of success mm-hmm. in that field. Mm-hmm. And for whatever the reason, whatever circumstances might have occurred are now kind of figuring out how to reinvent themselves. And and need that guidance as far right. as figuring out, okay, what's what's the next best step to take to get that message out there and for me to be seen as a very distinguishable um and um and valuable commodity for others that need the services that they provide. Right. And gosh, so many. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you know, I think when you uh so I it, it, I resonate with this deeply as I was a competitive high school and college athlete. And then there was a moment where I quit and cause it was no longer serving me. It was actually hurting me. And, um, and there is that loss of identity is like, who am I? You know, what, what next, who do I become? You're, and you're, you're figuring out that at that age, I was 21 or so. So I was like, well, <laughs> what do I do now? Mm-hmm. Uh, where do I invest my time? And then, uh, later in life, um, uh, was um, laid off when I was eight months pregnant from a corporate Oof. kind of PR uh, role. Yeah. Um, and just really didn't know who I was anymore and needed some, I, I did fortunately have help at that time of, of kind of putting my, you know, putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, <laughs> like where, you know, okay, point me in a direction and put me somewhere. Cause you know, it's, it's, that is, um, we were talking before we started recording about how entrepreneurship can be very lonely, but that transition is very lonely too. Um, yeah. So, so what a cool, and what a cool niche. We're also talking about vulnerability. <laughs> yeah. And and that's such a, such a huge thing. And you know, for me, when I had that wake up call that that I had spoken of, um, it was really difficult at first for me to put my pride aside. Yeah. It's like, well, you know what? I got myself into this mess. I got to figure out how to get myself Mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. If I reach out to others, am I going to be seen as weak? Am I going to be seen as less than? Especially considering that, again, I had this level of success in this prior role and then it just all fell apart. So how am I going to be deemed by others Mm -hmm. considering that past track record and that Mm -hmm. that history? And what I realized over time is, is that, People don't care. No, you know? <laughs> they think so about you a lot, a lot less than you, you think jump. they do. <laughs> yes, and that and that was the thing is that I needed to set my ego aside mm-hmm. and and realize that people aren't really thinking of me in in that way. Mm-hmm. If it if anyway, 
Um, so it's just really a matter of how can I just be my most genuine self mm-hmm. and um, and ask for the help that I need and um, and then realize that people love helping. Yep, so they do. Yeah, especially a specific test. Heck yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, you know, th- that was a good turning point for me as well to know sure. that nobody became a success on their own. Right. There was always someone, somehow, that, that was boosting them up in some way, shape, or yeah. form. It's so interesting, you know, when we're young and we're projecting forward, oh, I want to do this with my life or or that. And here is the linear path that I'm going to take to achieve these goals. And then as you mature and look back, you realize, you know, whether um, hopefully you're looking at it with a a healthy mentality of, you know, maybe that wasn't exactly what I wanted, but it got me forward and then laterally and and then moving forward. Um, But even more so, just like you pointed out that the those it was really dots connected along that was showing you that it was it was storytelling all along <laughs> um and i think yeah. uh you know what if if i were talking to my younger self to be like all this is making sense you know the, there was when i was in eighth grade riding on my bike around the neighborhood trying to put together a babysitting business. I mean, it's like entrepreneurship was there along, maybe not taking care of other people's kids, but uh, you know, it was like business ownership was going to mm. be a part of my life. Always loving reading, checking out as many books as I possibly can from the library, like as many as they would literally let me and then bringing them back a couple of days later, it's just stories and, and, and all that, you know, it's, it's, we are who we are. And although we evolve, hopefully um, I think there's a lot of beauty there that um, sometimes we don't notice till we're, have a few more gray hairs. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Better late than never. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it's also relatable. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cause I mean, who can identify with, with someone who has always been able to make the right decisions yeah. mm-hmm. and to always achieve success? Mm-hmm. Life isn't linear. Mm-hmm. So how can we expect our careers to be as well? Right. Right. I love that. So you already answered my first official question, which was, are you an inpatient entrepreneur? And it was a resounding yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Yes. Entrepreneur, person. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm realizing that um, while some of that is softening for me, you know, I'm, I'm able to be more patient. I definitely still have that impatient leap every time I'm excited about something or starting something new. I'm like, everybody Tell me now. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but uh, anyway, so um, what are you specifically impatient about right now, if anything? Scaling. Yeah. So yeah. at this mm-hmm. point, so I'm a year and a half in. Mm-hmm. And as a story brand guide, you know, you, you, you get kind of sold into the universe mm-hmm. by hearing about all these wonderful success stories. Yeah. And then you start comparing yourself <laughs> to all these wonderful success yeah. stories, not understanding any of the backstory, not understanding any of the context and, and what else goes into making the sausage. And um, you know, certainly it's a, it's a point of frustration for me when I'm not hitting those benchmarks that I had laid out for myself in the time frame that I had laid out for mm-hmm, myself. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, but with life in general, as well as career, I I also know that I've been my own worst enemy on many occasions sure. by attempting to take shortcuts that, ironically, <laughs> set me back even further yes. anytime I can't find instant gratification. So for me, it's really a matter of of looking back at certain junctures. So if I look back a month ago, it might be hard to see the forest from the trees and realize, okay, well, how much have I done in a month? If I look back four years from ago, you know, to today, when I was unemployed, had a crumbling marriage, was waking up on my birthday to a <laughs> panic attack, was you know hemorrhaging money and my health, clearly I've I've taken leaps and bounds mm-hmm. as far as where I was yeah. and uh, and where I am. So uh, it's really perspective at right. the end of the day, mm-hmm. and really kind of understanding that those. Those little things that I'm doing, the little habits that I created along the way, which, by the way, was the primary reason Mm -hmm. why I was able to change my life around. Mm -hmm. It was those small little increments Mm -hmm. that I was able to to take, you know, that I knew were going to help to improve my life. Mm -hmm. So give you an example. 
when I, you know, had that come up and, and I was trying to figure out, okay, well, what's next now? Mm-hmm. Now that I know that I need to take action and that my back's against the wall, uh, what action am I going to take? Um, I came up with um, daily tasks that I felt were most important for me to turn turn that ship around. And originally, I came up with, I believe it was 24 different tasks that I felt were important. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I wound up ranking each one from zero to five Mm -hmm. as far as how well of it I I, I did. So in other words, Lauren, I completely overcomplicated the game. (laughs) But through a series of fits and starts and trial and error, and over the next several months, I was able to whittle that list down from 24 to 10. Mm -hmm. And instead of, of ranking how well I did, I uh, either did it or I didn't do Mm -hmm. it. And if I did it, I checked it off the Mm -hmm. list. And the most important thing was to check that box and keep that chain going. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I discovered by really kind of taking the judgment out of it and also taking the excuses out of it, because the two excuses I would always have for really anything that I would embark upon were I don't have the time and I don't have the energy. Okay, so uh, exercise is a big one. So I grew up and talking about pivoting, um, my, uh, my father died at a young age, mm. uh, rare form of cancer at 39 years mm. old. And my mom's form of escapism was to, um, really lean into, uh, exercise and bodybuilding to the point where she became a competitive bodybuilder wow. in her forties. Wow. Yes. And then from there became a certified personal trainer. So it was very inspirational cool. and growing up again, aspiring athlete, we had this full gym mm-hmm. in our basement. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, every time I would work out, it would be extremely painful. Uh, I would be sore for days. Not to mention I would be humbled because it was my mom training me. So here's this middle-aged lady yeah. that was kicking my ass. Beware the middle-aged and, uh, ladies. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, I know that now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, upstairs, I also had a cable TV that had about 100 different channels. I know that's nothing these yeah. days, uh, but it was enough to keep me occupied. And that was the easier route to take. So that kind of stuck with me. That was the habit that I had formed throughout and into my adult years. And every time that I wanted to try to get myself back into shape, the excuses I had were, well, I don't have the time to go to the gym Mm -hmm. and I don't have the energy either. Mm -hmm. There's so much stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Well, what if I do one push-up? Yeah. Well, I certainly have the time for one Mm push-up. Um, I certainly have the energy. If I don't have the energy to do one push-up, I got far more issues, yeah. <laughs> far bigger issues. Yeah. So go um, <laughs> I started with that. Yeah. And um, what I realized is that, well, you know, when I started that one push-up, well, hey, I'm already here. Mm-hmm. I might as well do a set of push-ups. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm starting to feel good getting, you know, mm-hmm. getting the blood flowing. Maybe I'll do a few sets mm-hmm. to the point now where fast forward four years later, not only am I in the best shape of my life, mm-hmm. but if I'm not working out each day at least 30 to 40 minutes, now I feel off because of that, yeah, yeah. as opposed to making excuses for not doing mm-hmm. it. So, you know, the, the, the script literally flipped. Mm-hmm. And the same applied to all these other daily habits. So meditation, mm-hmm. well, I'm, you know, I'm textbook ADD, <laughs> I'm Mr. Monkey Brain, how am I supposed to sit in silence and observe my thoughts mm-hmm. for 10 or 15 minutes? Yeah. Well, can I start with one minute mm-hmm. and just observe it without any judgment and see where it goes. And now again, same thing. Every day, I'm meditating at least 15 minutes. And if I don't, I feel it. Yeah. So that's the thing that I would tell anyone that's impatient about starting these habits, Mm -hmm. starting any new endeavor, whether it be a business, a lifestyle change, et cetera, is that A, you got to start And without taking, uh, without having any judgment about it. Mm -hmm. And B, you got to start ridiculously small, Mm -hmm. almost to the point where it's silly to say, well, I'm just going to do this one thing. I'm going to write one sentence (laughs) if I want to start journaling. I want to, you know, kind of observe one thought for 30 seconds Mm -hmm. because eventually what that does is it aggregates. Mm -hmm. And eventually it just, that habit starts forming on its own to the point where you start honoring those small successes Mm -hmm. and you start creating that momentum because now you're embracing these small things. Um, And as someone who wanted to be an athlete and as, as I'm sure, you know, too, Lauren, being in competitive sports, the cliche statements that we would always hear from coaches, uh, even when I was in sales and from sales management is, you know, go hard or go, (laughs) no pain or no (laughs) gain, always do your best. Mm -hmm. But here's the problem for me that did the exact opposite. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. if my best wasn't good enough, yeah. and if I couldn't work as hard as what I felt was, you know, was the standard, mm-hmm. 
then I would be much more prone to just quit mm-hmm. and give up because I didn't feel like I was good enough right. and I would get down on myself. Mm-hmm. But what if I did my least? <laughs> what if I just did the bare minimum? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and instead of, you know, just do it, just do something. Mm-hmm. And 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 that really was was huge for me because right. because it allowed me to get out of my own way and, and and start making the progress that I so desperately needed. Are you an atomic habits guy, James Clear? I am. <laughs> yes, I read that. That was one of the one of the many books yes. that that I consumed mm-hmm. in that transitionary uh, period for me. Mm-hmm. And you know, it reaffirmed what I was already doing. Right. So that was great. It was like, okay, well, mm-hmm. this guy's saying the same thing, mm-hmm. and he's a best selling author and yeah. you know a national brand. So. Um, I might be onto something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, I think especially, uh, I, absolutely. It was, it was like all or nothing. And, and that mentality, both for, I think, personal wellness and, and mental health is, is not great. You know, I've, I've had to transition over time to what doesn't feel punitive. <laughs> what do I actually like doing? Um, and right. then, uh, and then in business too, you know, I, I have to talk to clients all the time about, um, you know, uh, don't let perfect be the enemy, the enemy of the good. You know, we've sometimes we just got to go. Sometimes we have to ship it. Like we'll iterate it later, mm-hmm. but we can sit here all day and try to perfect it, but we're going to lose the thread. And it's just, it's, we're not going to sell anything if it doesn't get out there. <laughs> yeah. You need to give yourself permission to fail. Mm-hmm. And that was the other thing that yeah. I learned far too late in life yeah. is that there are no success stories mm-hmm. that haven't gone through a period of failure. Mm-hmm. You need to, you need to fail forward into your, into your success in order to understand how to continue to evolve. You know, if you don't know what it's like to have a setback, how are you going to know what it's like to finally get through those obstacles when they do surface? Because it's inevitable. So you need to be able to be hardened in a way yeah. um, to, to be able to, to get through the fire when those actual moments occur. Right. And, and greeting, and greeting failure as uh, a teaching and a a blessing in many cases. I actually have a friend. She's been on the podcast, Jennifer Sweeney. I think she was episode three. Uh, she has young kids that are my kids' ages, and she does what something that she calls desensitizing failure. She gives her kids scratch off lottery kit tickets. <laughs> so they, like just get used to like micro do- microdosing <laughs> failure. That's what she calls it. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Uh-huh. And I, I'm oh, not this time. I know. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do it with my kids too. Cause I'm seeing the, like the hesitation to try new things cause they want to get it perfectly. And like, no, 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 yeah. no. <laughs> we just got to get started. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, yeah. yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I can relate. So I have a, a daughter is in middle school this year and she was really getting into dance. And then they were opening up tryouts for the dance team. And she became her own worst enemy. She was so hard on herself. And she's like, dad, I just can't get these. Uh, These routines, right? It's not going to work. It's not going to happen. I was like, you know what? The biggest regret you're going to have is if you decide that you're going to pull out of the competition and not give yourself a chance to fail, Mm -hmm. because then you're always going to use that as an excuse to not try. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd like to think that that resonated with her. (laughs) And I said, you know, just do something. And you know what? I want you to do it with the intention of doing it crap. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's like, what do you, what do you mean? Dad? Why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. I was like, because that's where things start. That's where you're building kind of the, the foundational piece. Mm-hmm. And that's what I used to always tell my students too, when I was teaching writing is I want you to write something crappy today. Mm-hmm. Okay. They call it a first draft for a reason. Yeah. I want you to breeze through it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then at that point, now you have at least the infrastructure because what you're going to realize is that through that crappy rendition, mm-hmm. whatever it might be, there's going to be some some little gold nuggets out of that. Yeah. As long as there's an effort to it, mm-hmm. okay? You can put an effort and still be crappy and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you need to give yourself permission for that mm-hmm. because at that point, then you'll be able to, to pull out what worked and build off of everything else and fill in those gaps and that's how you continue to grow. That's how you continue to evolve. Yeah. And um, she made the team and she's doing oh, excellent now. Yay, so, good, good. It's you know, all you. Hopefully <laughs> that's a lesson. I'll, I'll take some credit, but oh, you know what? 0. At the end 2%. of the day, <laughs> yes, whatever it might be, hopefully, hopefully she'll remember that. Uh, yes. So, um, Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird uh, committee to the... Um, Another one I've read. Uh, yep. I'll, I'll just say crappy first draft. <laughs> yes. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. So we're, we're certainly on theme here for the next question. Um, Go for what's it. something that, you know, has happened? I know you've already touched on it probably. Um, that's happened in your business life where you, at the moment you thought, 
this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me or that could happen to me. I'm not going to recover from this, but ultimately it's turned out to be the best thing to happen. Okay. And this is very recent. This is probably after I, I, I booked this, this podcast. Okay. Written, okay. So <laughs> I'm ready. Worked out I'm ready. Well. I, got, I got new material. <laughs> yeah. So, um, September was turning out to be the best business month since I had launched the, uh, you know, my, yeah. my company mm -hmm. and I was really excited. And the biggest one out of those, um, you know, I, I, I brought them up. We had a verbal agreement. I was really excited. I was, it was going to be kind of a full suite of services when it came to, um, you know, the brand messaging and outreach and coaching and super excited. And then, um, uh, then they went silent for a week or two, and usually that's not a good sign. Yeah. Um, not always, yeah. not always. Yeah. You can't make assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, but then I checked back in. They said, well, you know what? Some things just happened. We had to reshuffle the deck mm -hmm. and reprioritize, and let's revisit in January. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, I'd already counted my chickens, if you will, mm -hmm. and I was already kind of focusing on, okay, this is great. This is going to allow me to, to absolutely get recertified mm -hmm. in December. Mm -hmm. This is going to allow me to start planning ahead because I was doing a lot of month to month yeah. as far as my business goals. Sure. And then it was taken away and I didn't have something to supplant that. And it probably was not even a, a, a week later, um, I had uh, connected with somebody locally, in fact, mm -hmm that um, was interested in getting their book adapted into a screenplay. Mm, cool. And as mentioned, I went to yeah, film yeah, school yeah. and it was always the pipe dream <laughs> mm -hmm. of mine. It still is. Mm -hmm. My bucket list is to walk the red carpet yeah. uh, on uh, a feature length screenplay that I had written. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, life happens. And, you know, there were moments when I stopped making that uh, a realistic um, dream. Sure. And then all of a sudden this came to be, um, he wound up commissioning me Almost the same amount. Okay. Um, as uh, not not entirely, but almost the same amount, and um, and it allowed me to really kind of um check off something that had been um such a pipe dream, mm -hmm. you know, for so long, mm -hmm. is to now be a paid screenwriter. Yeah. I, I'd done a lot of you know contests and you know had some local accolades, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I can never say I was a professional screenwriter because yeah. I wasn't getting paid for it. So now I can actually say that. Um, and what I'm also discovering as I'm going through right now, it's the pre-writing process. I just finished the outline. The goal, as ambitious as it might be, is to finish the first draft before the end of the year, um, is that I'm discovering a lot about my own story through telling his. Because it's actually an autobiography that we're going to be um, pivoting into uh, or transitioning into uh, an adapted screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, the guy's the most interesting man that most people haven't heard of. Mm -hmm. He was in a couple pretty known rock bands in the 60s and 70s. Cool. Um, I, I like to say, I'm, I'm likening it to um, it's Forrest Gump with an existential crisis. That's the best way to kind of describe <laughs> okay, it. Okay, so, I can't wait. <laughs> a little teaser. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when this comes out, mm -hmm. people will know to, to, to kind of check this out. Okay. But um, it's allowing me to, to kind of really learn about his story mm -hmm. and, and, and figure out how it can apply to my own, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, but also how it can apply it to my own brand mm -hmm. as far as these fits and spurts that he had gone sure. through, the discoveries that he made along the way, the humbling experiences that he had made. Uh, and how he had to reinvent himself a couple of times along the way because he had quit the rock and roll business at the height of his fame at 30 years old mm, and decided wow. he was just going to jump into another career. So again, very serendipitous yeah. because I was working with those people anyway, mm -hmm. but now I'm doing it in a different capacity and in one that you know uh, I've I've wanted to do for so many years. So Congrats. Um, That's exciting. blessing in disguise yeah. right there. Yeah. yeah, It's extremely <laughs> exciting for sure. Well, very mm -hmm. cool. Can't wait to... I'm sure you'll keep us posted. I can't wait to see uh, Stay tuned. <laughs> that, that uh, come yes. to fruition. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Now, going mm -hmm. back in time, what was something mm -hmm. that um, growing up, people made you feel like a part of you was a weakness? Like, oh, Jeff, you're too this, you're too that. But really, now that you're an adult and running a business, you realize it's actually your superpower. I'd say probably the ADD that I mentioned mm -hmm, before. Mm -hmm. So, which growing up was actually undiagnosed at the time, okay. which which made me get even more down on myself. How I, I didn't get diagnosed you with when ADD. You were diagnosed? 20, 26. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah, you, you went pretty you, old. You went all for through most of your formal education, I guess. Then at that point. <laughs> yes, and in hindsight, it makes total sense because, yeah. as mentioned, I always had chase the shiny object mm -hmm. syndrome. I it was always hard for me to kind of. Uh, focus on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I was all over the place. I was easily distracted, uh, occasionally impulsive. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and 
as an adult, uh, I've been able to harness that energy and and realize that many others with ADD and ADHD have unique, uh, you know, cr- creative abilities, mm-hmm. uh, and perhaps ironically, you know, uh, tend to get deep into a zone and, and produce outstanding results <laughs> once they're engaged mm-hmm. with something aligned with those passions right, and skills. Right. You know, but you know, however, for years, I, I couldn't latch on to what felt like a purpose driven passion. You know, I'd mentioned kind of the home improvement stuff and this, where there were certain elements that worked. I loved like kind of the leadership component of one thing, Mm -hmm. but not the, you know, the interest of the industry in the other. Or I enjoyed the industry, but not my role, but they weren't all fitting in. So uh, it wasn't until I started my own business when I realized, well, now, you know, I get to put all the pieces together. I don't have to be at the mercy of, you know, an employer telling me, well, this is how you do it. Mm-hmm. And this is how you don't do it and all that. So, uh, and even through all those months where I wasn't really earning anything or earning much or, or certainly far less than I was in previous jobs, mm-hmm. it, it somehow felt right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was no longer feeling like a supporting character in somebody else's script. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, now to the point where today, uh, I'm still not at that point financially where I was even a few years ago, mm-hmm. but Again, it feels like I'm in my element. Right. And that's the most important thing to me because when I was, you know, you know, in that sales management job and making six figures and, you know, uh, and, and leading these teams, I also felt like my integrity was at stake mm-hmm. and I, you know, was, was feeling out of place. So what good was that doing if I was, you know, living a great life on paper or a great career on paper? But coming home every day feeling miserable. Right. You know, that's not, you know, true success, you know, is is as simple as we make it out to be, mm-hmm. which is to me, it's happiness. Right. You know, right, that, right, that's right. it. If you're happy, <laughs> yeah. you're a success. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't matter what else you have. You're happy, you're content in your own skin. Everything else is gravy. Right. And that's what I've I've been able to accomplish at this point is that I have this immense gratitude that I didn't necessarily have before that is allowing me to to kind of keep that momentum going um to the point where um i i absolutely still believe that i'm going to get to where i ultimately want to mm-hmm. be but i'm also not wanting for anything that i don't already have right and and that's something that i was never able to say before mm, beautiful and i feel like we need to close a loop you have recently remarried <laughs> I have. You're lucky I in have. love once again. <laughs> I really am. And you know what? If it wasn't for all these things mm-hmm. that I had done mm-hmm. to make myself a better person, I wouldn't have been able to find that amazing person yeah. that's making me even better yeah. of a person because the vibe, the vibrations wouldn't have been right. There. We wouldn't have been on the same frequency because I would have been this guy still feeling sorry for myself, still sputtering around, you know? I, I tell my wife, you know, uh, she 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 certainly bought low on me, <laughs> uh, and and um, but she doesn't care, mm-hmm. which is even better. Yeah. I mean, she's like, well, I you know, I I got what I got, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm grateful for it, and <laughs> you know, it, it, it's amazing how things work out. But it wouldn't have done, it, it wouldn't have been that case, whether it be the career, whether it be my mental health, mm-hmm. and certainly uh, my my relationship and my marriage now if i didn't get more clarity on exactly what i needed to do and who i who i wanted to become right right powerful so as we wrap up uh what is one piece of advice you can give our listeners that they can do today to make their lives or uh businesses stronger and better the one thing they can do today mm-hmm. or start I would doing say, <laughs> yes one push up <laughs> <laughs> one push up for sure. Start small yeah. would be one. Yeah. Um, another thing that comes to mind, you know, maybe it's obvious, but I, I often see it not happening. Show that you genuinely care about your audience. Mm. Again, it sounds obvious, but sometimes it's easier said than done. Mm-hmm. We may truly care, but but struggle to figure out how to convey that in our story right. or, or in the content that we put out. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes it's because we also struggle with identifying that prevailing pain point um, and 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 the clarity in our own message. On, on how we're uniquely qualified to provide a solution. And then we, we kind of manifest that same thing as far as feeling that imposter syndrome right. when we're trying to reach out to somebody else. Right. So, you know, too often we, we try to overcompensate. We spend too much time using hero talk, mm-hmm. you know, meaning that we overpromote ourselves mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, yeah. I'm worthy, the, I, swear, the I promise. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, and 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 people kind of smell that. I call it commission breath. You know, <laughs> when, when I was in sales, you know, people smell that a mile away, yeah. <laughs> and they'll realize that you're reaching. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is that nobody cares how great you are until you show them how great you can make them. And um, and that's the most important thing is because if, if we're going to decide to become an entrepreneur, and you know we're, we're going to build our own business and build our own brands, then we shouldn't have to settle. A mm -hmm. But B, we also should be able to find these connecting points and these stories that show that we get it um, and, and also find our tribe at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, the relationship has to be two-sided. And if all we're doing is just putting out a product or putting out a service or, or, or creating this amazing deliverable that we spent all summer working on mm -hmm. and then casting this wide net and just keeping our fingers crossed that somebody comes as opposed to identifying who that specific someone is that's you know going to be able to resonate with us the most then all we're doing is just spinning our wheels at the end of the day that's great. Well, Jeff, I'm so glad you came on and shared your vulnerability and your story. Uh, if if Thank folks want to, if folks are in transition and they feel like they really need a guide to get them safely to the other side, how can they find you and do business with you? Sure. You can check out my site, uh, www.brandscribed.com. So basically like transcribed, but with a B. <laughs> I like that. Um, you know, I, I, I hang out a lot on LinkedIn. That, that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's where a lot of my tribe is as well. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, if you go onto my site, you'll see that I'm offering some, some free stuff. Go ahead and get that free stuff because who doesn't love free? Um, and hopefully that'll provide some value as far as clarifying your message and figuring out what the next step is on having that own, you know, your own captivated audience as well. And, you know, if I can further help along that journey, I'm happy to do so. Great. Thanks. And we'll pop all that in the show notes too for easy access. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Impatient Entrepreneur. Love the podcast? Be sure to share it with a friend or colleague or give us a five-star review on Apple. You can also chat with us on Instagram or Facebook at The Impatient Entrepreneur Pod. Want to star on a future episode? Head over to theimpatiententrepreneurpod.com to inquire. Thank you to the team at Quedar Co. for believing in me and bringing this podcast to life. And thank you to Carson Childers for mixing and editing this episode. Can't wait to see you next time.